And ultimately, if your mental health is not stabilized, you are at risk for even worse health outcomes. Dr. Anique Forrester, thank you so much for joining me tonight here on eShadowing. How are you doing tonight, my friend? I'm great. So happy to be here. I'm excited to chat with you again. You were recently on uh, the Specialty Stories podcast talking all about your specialty. So if people want to learn more about you, they can go check that out as well. But we're here to talk about consultation liaison medicine, a fun name for a great specialty in psychiatry. One of the questions that we love asking here on, on eShadowing is what is bread and butter for your specialty? The bread and butter, and some of this I'll go over in the presentation, is essentially we are the psychiatrists who take care of people who are medically ill. So it can be acute illness or managing stable chronic illness. Um, and we live on the interface of medicine and psychiatry. I love it. I think there's a lot of, of people out there when you say psychiatrist, they think sitting in a, like an old home, like a <laughs> 1800s home on a big <laughs> lounge chair and, and the psychiatrist sitting there um, just asking lots of questions. But you're in the hospital taking care of sick people, right? Absolutely. So for, for potentially for people who love psychiatry, the thought process and medicine of psychiatry, but also still want some of that medicine part mm -hmm. that, that a lot of people don't think goes along with psychiatry. So I'm excited to chat. I know you have a great presentation lined up for us. So let's go ahead and jump into that. And then if there's some time at the end, we'll do lots of Q&A. Okay. So I will go ahead and click start. Uh, okay. Can everybody see this? Yes, ma'am. All right. Um, so, yeah, so my name is Anique Forrester. I am a consultation liaison psychiatrist, and I'm also the director of the Consultation Liaison Psychiatry Fellowship, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, as, a, as a student myself, a college student who was pre-med, I knew I wanted to be a psychiatrist, but I didn't exactly know what my life would look like as a psychiatrist. So I'm excited to kind of share with you all a little bit about what that is. A lot of students who are undecided, um, who are in medical school, when they rotate uh, on the CL service, they kind of fall in love with it because it's, it's an area of psychiatry that most people don't know about. And it's something that I found out about as a medical student because I thought I was going to be a child psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And then I did this rotation and here I am. Um, so let's just head into it. <clears throat> So consultation liaison psychiatry or CL is a subspecialty within psychiatry. And again, we are the interface between psychiatry and other medical specialties. We care for patients with acute and chronic medical illnesses, and we work with their doctors. So it's not just about the patients for us. Um, a CL psychiatrist can work in a hospital setting, an emergency room, or an outpatient clinic. Um, and training in CL begins as a psychiatry resident. So if you're in medical school, uh, you may you have to do a psychiatry rotation, but you may or may not be assigned to do consultation. So it just depends on your medical school, what they have available. But if you choose to pursue psychiatry, the requirement is usually doing two months of CL um, to become a, a psychiatrist and to finish residency training. And so if you like it, and you feel like you want to do it as a career, a lot of psychiatry residents choose to do electives as fourth years. Um, and then there's a one-year fellowship. So that's what I'm the director of. Um, and you have to complete the fellowship in order to be board certified as a CL psychiatrist. Um, and so we were first recognized as a specialty in 2003 as a subspecialty in psychiatry. And the name was changed from psychosomatic medicine to consultation liaison psychiatry in 2018 because it was a lot of confusion about what psychosomatic means. Um, and so for anybody who wants to learn more about CL, you can visit the website of the uh, Academy for Consultation Liaison Psychiatry or the ACLP. And their website is www.clpsychiatry.org. And then they have a page specifically uh, dedicated to medical students to kind of tell medical students, students in the pre-med years, exactly what consultation liaison psychiatry is all about. All right. 
So why would you choose to be a, a CL psychiatrist? So let's say you're thinking about medicine. Let's say you're even thinking about psychiatry. Why do CL? Um, and as we talked about, it's like we are at the interface of medicine and psychiatry. So the best CL psychiatrists are the people who want to care for those who have significant medical illness and know how these illnesses affect mental health who want to work actively with primary care physicians or other doctors to optimize a patient's care because we realize that collaborative care is the future in medicine. And so collaborating with other doctors and other healthcare professionals is going to be key, um, as well as to integrate people's physical and their mental health. Um, so we're sort of the pioneers with that. And also, if you're sort of a person who's interested in educating not only your medical colleagues, but patients and their families about mental illness, how to identify and treat those illnesses, especially when people are sick, and also recognizing psychiatric manifestations of illnesses, because people don't realize that sometimes uh, a medical illness may first show up with behavioral or psychiatric changes. And so you have to be aware that you need to look for that uh, and make sure that somebody isn't sick, like with a brain tumor thyroid disease. Those are some of the common things that can cause behavioral changes. And then also CL psychiatrists are the people that think about the larger needs of patients and the hospital and medical systems in general and how we can better integrate psychiatry and mental health treatment into the larger care needs of patients. Um, and so what's happened in the past is that psychiatrists as Ryan was mentioning, sort of have been historically thought about as people sitting on a couch in an office somewhere, <laughs> you go there, but it's not incorporated into the rest of your health care. And so in CL, we're the folks that sort of have always championed that you have to integrate people's mental health and their physical health, like the two are not separate. And so that if you're thinking that that's the type of doctor you want to be, that's the type of psychiatrist you want to be. You should be really thinking about whether or not CL makes sense for you. Yeah. Okay. And Ryan, I'm not paying attention to the chat. So if people I'm have following. questions, yeah. you can I'll, stop I'll me at any you. time. Awesome. Uh, what, do, what does a CL psychiatrist do every day? So I work in the hospital, um, but CL psychiatrists can work in a lots of different settings. So in a hospital, we're going to do consultations on patients who have been admitted, uh, whether it's internal medicine, surgery, oncology. Uh, we might even go to the clinical team rounds, listen to the case presentations, uh, decide if a psychiatric intervention is needed, uh, provide suggestions on how to collaborate more effectively with the patients, especially if they're having behavioral issues. And we also may be involved in le legal or ethical consultations, like evaluating people's medical decision-making capacity or actually participating on an ethics committee. So usually if a psychiatrist is involved in an ethics committee, it's a CL psychiatrist. Um, so we can talk a little bit more about that if there are questions. Uh, in emergency rooms, a CL psychiatrist could do a variety of things, including consults to do risk assessments like for suicide, helping to evaluate if a an acute behavioral change is due to a medical and or a psychiatric problem. So we think about like delirium, which I'll talk a little bit about, dementia. If somebody has a progressive dementia and their behavior is changing, uh, is a psychiatrist input needed to help manage that? And we recommend appropriate treatments, including medications, as well as, le as level of care. So does that person need to be admitted to a psychiatric unit? Would they be better served on the regular hospital side? So we're usually involved in that decision making. And then in the outpatient setting, uh, a CL psychiatrist could do a lot of different things, but we usually work in a clinic that is primarily run by another medical specialty. Um, so that's the interdisciplinary kind of work that we do. So we are involved in lots of aspects of the patient's care, but we're working in a primary care clinic, um, I've worked in an HIV clinic and I have a, a case example we'll talk about later of some of the work that I did there. Um, but it's usually that you're in a setting that you're working directly with doctors who are managing the care of the patient. And that's another area to provide education about how psychiatric illness affects whatever's going on with the person medically and to also be able to optimize their care.
So one one question that just came in, and I'm not sure I follow along with it, but I'll ask. It said, would the evaluation to be able to make medical decisions only apply to the patient, or would a guardian or parent also be evaluated? So we don't specifically evaluate. Uh, the, that person would be called a surrogate decision maker. What we do is establish whether or not the patient is able to make their own decisions by uh, doing a series of uh, examinations and asking the patient a series of questions about what's wrong with them and trying to get a sense of their understanding about what treatments are being proposed for them. And then if we find that the person is unable to make their own medical decisions, then uh, there is a sort of a legal guideline that we use that establishes who the surrogate should be. Um, and for most states, it there's a, a list and an order of who the surrogates are in terms of the person's family, next of kin, a uh, uh, a power attorney, that kind of thing. But we don't evaluate those people. We are just helping the team to understand that the patient can't make their own decision and require some help. Okay. Okay. Um, and as usually when it comes to medical decision-making capacity, uh, CL psychiatrists are recognized as court uh, experts in terms of making these decisions. So uh, oftentimes we have to actually go to court and testify when somebody needs like a permanent guardian, things like that. Nice. Another question here, when when you're in the hospital with all these different departments, um, are you are you working in all of them, whoever needs you, or or do you specialize more in oncology or more in uh, transplant or something like that? Uh, so it depends on where you work. For me, I I uh, work with two other psychiatrists on a general service. And so we do reactive consults where we just wait to be called uh, to evaluate patients. And then we have some proactive teams that we work with, like by going to their interdisciplinary rounds, uh, understanding if their patients uh, that they've had admitted that they're having issues with. So we do that a lot with internal medicine. Uh, when I did my fellowship, I had a lot of experience with oncology, women's mental health, and perinatal psychiatry. Um, so I still do some of that, but I'm sort of a general catch-all at this point. Um, but many CL psychiatrists choose to specialize further. Okay. All right. So let's get into some cases, because I think that this helps people to understand a little bit about what I do. Um, and you can kind of see some of the input that I give. Um, and I've had a lot of cases recently, uh, even in the past few weeks, I saw a medical student who had attempted suicide, um, but was admitted to the ICU because it was a Tylenol overdose. And so the liver functions were elevated. So you still have to be able to manage somebody like that, um, while they're still medically ill and then get them transitioned to the inpatient psychiatric unit. So that's uh, a lot of the work that we do. Um, so let's go through the first case. Um, Do you want to bring on a student to potentially ask some questions to? Oh, sure. It's up to you. Pimp some students here tonight. Absolutely. Uh, if you want to come on, raise your hand. I'll, I'll bring you on. Um, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Usually there's a 10 second delay or so until they hear me. Uh, we'll get some people on. Okay. All right. Here we go. Um, and so these cases are sort of, uh, a bit of a mishmash of patients that I've actually seen um, and situations that I've actually encountered in my career. Um, so Ms. Smith is a 32 year old woman with no significant past medical history who basically had this uh, severe constipation and rectal bleeding for about two years before she went to an emergency room. And in the emergency room, she had also severe abdominal pain and then they found out she had colon cancer. Uh, so she's undergoing chemotherapy now, uh, and is referred for a consultation because the oncology team is concerned about her treatment, non-compliance or non-adherence. So they want her to see a psychiatrist to evaluate whether or not she has depression and whether or not that's the cause of her not really adhering to her chemotherapy regimen as she should. So I want to stop there and see if people have questions just about that kind of a scenario. Okay, Selim, you're you're on here. You have any questions about this scenario? Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Hello. Um. So, 
reading because like I was like in the waiting room while I was trying to read it. But mm-hmm. I would ask, um, I think when it comes to depression, um, isn't there like uh, the standard time is I think two months of the symptoms where you have to be like, okay, like there, um, this is where you have to um, be aware of uh, asking if she has any healthy coping mechanisms, if there's like, like you have to ask hard questions, I guess, of like substance abuse mm-hmm. or like past trauma history, if they're comfortable sharing that. And if they're not comfortable, I guess like you have to make the environment comfortable. Um, and as well as like continue to, um, press like patient confidentiality and like, you know, like I'm here for you type of, uh, like comfort to make them, comfortable in telling you, okay, like this is what's been going on. Here are my coping Mm -hmm. mechanisms, healthy and unhealthy. So yeah, you have to do all of that, but then you have to also think about, so the way that we screen for depression, according to the DSM-5, is that you have to, the person has to meet five of nine criteria related to depression. And there's a lot of symptoms, including lack of appetite, poor sleep, oops, poor sleep, um, weight gain or weight loss, but she's getting chemotherapy. Um, and so they have to have five of nine of those criteria for at least two weeks to meet uh, the full criteria. For... Oh, is somebody talking? No, I'll mute. I think it's the other Okay. <laughs> for major depressive disorder. But one of the things about CL psychiatry is that we have to dig a little bit deeper because if people are medically ill, sometimes just the sequelae of their illness can look like depression. Um, So you could have chemotherapy, you could be having nausea and vomiting and losing weight because of that. You could be fatigued, sort of withdrawn from your friends and family because you feel so tired. You could also be dealing with the stress of knowing that you have cancer. So it could be affecting your mood. So there's many different aspects of what happens when somebody is diagnosed with cancer, uh, some of which is normal and some of which is abnormal. So that's what we have to really uh, sort out. Okay. So I'll tell you more about what she said. Okay. Um, So when you talk to her, she says, I don't know why they are so upset. It's my body. The chemotherapy makes me sick. I feel better when I miss treatments here or there, but I do want to get better. Hmm. She doesn't have a psychiatric history, but she has extensive history of sexual trauma. So part of the other thing that we have to do is ask people about their, the rest of their life, how, what sort of traumatic experiences they've had before a cancer diagnosis, because a cancer diagnosis is pretty traumatic. Um, and you have to screen them for the other things, like you mentioned, substance abuse. Um, she doesn't have any current psychiatric symptoms. So when you ask her the symptoms of depression, she says no. Um, and when you talk to her about her social supports, she has a very limited support system. She's unemployed and she's been unemployed because she was diagnosed with cancer. Mm. Remember, this is somebody 32. So this is very young Mm -hmm. to be having cancer. Most people don't have great health insurance. If you've got to come back and forth to chemotherapy, you got to have transportation. If you're feeling weak and sick after your chemo, Usually it's nice to have somebody be with you to be able to Mm -hmm. take care of you when you get home. So there's a lot of other factors that are affecting whether or not she's coming to her chemo. And when you're young, you really want to feel better. Mm -hmm. It's hard to feel so sick all the time. And she's getting chemo every other week. So that's quite frequent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I was actually, she said, you said she had a limited, limited support system, but she said, I don't know why they are so upset. So I was like, who else was, I was going to ask more about her support system. Yeah. Like, they is the oncology team. Okay. So part of the L and CL psychiatry is the liaison work that you do with the doctors who request that you see a patient. Because again, doctors usually are sort of expecting patients to do exactly what we say follow the directions exactly as we say them, do exactly what we need to do. Sometimes doctors may not understand why these patients would miss something like chemotherapy. So Mm -hmm. part of what the psychiatrist has to do is also go back to the oncology team and say, hey, here's some other things you might not have realized. She does want to get better. How can we support her? How can we utilize her existing supports? Can she get transportation? Are there other things that we can do to make it easier for her to get care? Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. 
Uh, a lot of doctors think it's just as easy as diagnosing a patient with depression and starting them on an antidepressant. But usually what we find out is it's much more complicated than that. Mm-hmm. Um, and our health system is has been slower to adapt to sort of making sure we, we're meeting patients where they are. Mm-hmm. Got it. Got it. This is like really interesting. I'm like, hmm. <laughs> yeah. The other thing to be aware of as a psychiatrist is that when you see somebody who's had such severe symptoms for so long and didn't seek treatment, you have to dig deeper because it's been two Mm -hmm. years going on. So you have to dig deeper. And again, because of her history of trauma, she may actually require something like therapy. Mm -hmm. Uh, It may not be specifically about medications. But again, if her support system is limited, if she's unemployed, how is she going to get to therapy? So you mm-hmm. have to think much more globally about a patient like this. You can't just say, here, go to therapy. Here's a referral by. And then by going to therapy, you can like determine if she does have any current psychiatric symptoms because she's, she denies it, but we don't know if it's actually like there. Right. And you don't know because think, think about something like, sorry, my son is, is banging on my door here. Oh, uh, you have to think about something like, especially the part of her body that's affected. It's a rectal cancer. Um, you don't know the nature of her trauma. So there's a lot to unpack here. Yeah. Um, and so it's it's important to kind of support patients. And even though they deny things in the beginning, you sometimes do need to dig a little bit deeper to get to it. And I think mm-hmm. that's what sometimes when a medical team refers a patient, they want the answer. Tell me now, sort of one and done. But sometimes it's more complicated than that. Right, right. I think it's a, this is a great case to to for everyone, non psychiatrists, future psychiatrists in, included, to make sure when you are interacting with patients, especially with invasive procedures, uh, she she may be getting radiation therapy directly into um, that lower part of her body, that you are getting permission, you are making sure they're okay at every step of the way, and as soon as mm-hmm. they say they're not, you stop, you give them time. Uh, because you have no idea what they they're going through. Absolutely, and Absolutely. most most doctors don't ask people about their trauma history or sort of any of their mental health symptoms in general. And so, one of the big things that I advocate for in CL psychiatry is that I want to make sure that doctors don't think of the patient as like a psych patient or they have a psychiatric problem. This is a whole person mm-hmm. that had a life uh, before they came to you. And it's up to doctors, any good doctor at this point, to really try to understand their patients. I, I know we're busy. We've got a lot of work to do. It's a lot to think about managing, but you have to try to get to know people. Um, that's a part of the lost art in medicine that we need to get back to. Insurance companies don't pay you to know people. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> but if you're treating somebody every other week, yeah. Um, and you're the oncologist that that's a lot of contact to not know anything about the patient other than their, their, their diagnosis and the treatment regimen that you recommended. Yeah. Okay. 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 All okay. right. So I'm going to move on to the next one. If, unless there's other questions about Ms. Smith. Mm, I have no further questions about Ms. Smith. Okay. Thanks for coming on. <laughs> Thanks. All right. We have Alex, uh, our next uh, sucker. I mean, uh, student. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here's our second case. This is Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Jones is a 62 year old woman who has lupus, uh, no other prior psychiatric history, and she presents to the emergency room. Uh, she's paranoid. She's delusional that she has cancer all over her body. We've we've ascertained that she does not have cancer. She's agitated, meaning she's sort of yelling and screaming, uh, moving around. She's very hyper-religious and she's hypersexual. So she's doing things that are totally out of character for her. Uh, so the emergency room team and the rheumatology team are concerned that she has something called lupus cerebritis, which is uh, a manifestation of lupus that affects the central nervous system. It's essentially inflammation. Um, and so because... Things that affect the brain can change people's behavior. Uh, It's very common for people with lupus cerebritis to become acutely altered, confused. And this is an example of what we call delirium. So delirium is a change in somebody's mental status that's usually due to a medical illness or a combination of various illnesses. 
Um, so the team consults psychiatry for assistance with her behavioral management because she's not just calmly sitting in the emergency room. She's yelling, screaming, uh, taking off her clothes, making comments. <laughs> it's not a good sight. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they had to sedate her to get an LP, which shows uh, ANA, positive ANA. Uh, there's no acute findings when they do CT and MRI of the brain. And the usual treatment for things like lupus cerebritis is steroids, IV steroids. Um, so she's had some improvements since she got her first dose. But the other thing about steroids is that they can worsen some of these behaviors, paranoia, agitation, uh, delusions. People can get uh, pretty, pretty altered with steroids. So I want to know if there's any questions about Mrs. Jones. Yeah. Um, I guess my question is, like, why is the loop about, like, can't tell her body? So it's hard to say why people get certain symptoms. The brain is like a very misunderstood organ. But her brain is inflamed because of the lupus. That's essentially what's going on. And so anytime the brain has an insult for any reason, whether it's a, there's a tumor, there's inflammation, somebody's had a stroke, anything uh, that affects the brain, you can have uh, psychiatric symptoms. And the symptoms will vary from patient to patient. It depends on the area of the brain. Uh, same thing with seizures. Uh, so it just depends on the area of the brain and, and what else is going on with the patient. Okay. Um, my, my other question, like, um, like, where, where did this come? When did it start? So she has lupus, and so it sounds like she has... Yeah, but called, how long did she have it? So she has probably what's called a lupus flare. So you can have lupus for a very long time, and yeah. the lupus typically flares in your body. But there are sometimes, occasionally, where you can have a lupus flare in your brain, and that's what they call lupus cerebritis. It's very difficult to predict who will get that um, complication from lupus? Not everybody gets it. She probably got it because she's older. Yeah. Um, and also, it sounds like her outpatient doctor started her on steroids because she was potentially having a lupus flare. But the steroids, as I mentioned, can make those symptoms worse. The paranoia yeah. being delusional. But that's the treatment for lupus cerebritis. But, but like, what other med uh, medication is there? Available to her. So unfortunately, to treat the acute flare, it's really only steroid. And so we as the psychiatrists have to manage the behaviors with our medication. So if you see in the recommendations, okay. we recommended that the team start quetiapine, which is an That'd antipsychotic medication. Um, yelling at yeah. Um, like, maybe the psychiatrists yeah. need to look at different treatment for this person uh, 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 because it seems like steroids aren't doing her good. Right. So it, it becomes like a risk-benefit discussion. So whenever a patient has an illness that requires treatment with a certain medication, even if the medication may make their behavior worse, Doctors have to really think about what are the risks to the patient and what are the benefits if we give the medication or if we don't. And so at the time, it sounds like the doctors felt like they had to use the steroids. And then as a CL psychiatrist, what we do is we give medications that can be used temporarily to control the behavior. Because one of the things that's happening is that she's dangerous. She's unsafe um, because yeah. she's taking her clothes off. She's agitated, maybe aggressive towards other people. So that's why in the hospital, we said you need a one-to-one, -one, like somebody needs to be with you while you're in the hospital to keep her safe. And that's yeah. usually something that a psychiatrist recommends. And then ultimately the steroids get tapered down 
And the quetiapine, which is the antipsychotic medication, gets tapered down. But we've got to get Mrs. Jones through this acute period while she has the flare. Oh, the brain and, and <laughs> the brain. Lots of people are confused. They're like, what does ANA stand for? That's a, a good question for the, the rheumatology uh, <laughs> yeah, team. Yeah, if there's anybody who <laughs> wants to do rheumatology. So the ANA refers to uh, a titer that we look at um, that shows up positive when people have lupus. It's very specific to lupus. Um, and it's it's an inflammatory um, sort of uh, antibody that shows up in your body, in your immune system. And in medical school, you will learn all about this. And so if, yep. you, if the person has lupus and you suspect they're having a flare, you have to check the blood for the ANA. Um, and then you, for her, because they thought it was lupus cerebritis, they did a lumbar puncture because um, mm. then you would see it there in her cerebrospinal fluid as well. So it's definitely something you will learn all about in medical school. <laughs> lots and lots of lots. <laughs> but if if you if you see a positive ANA in the blood or in the CSF, the person has lupus. Okay. All right. What next? All right. <laughs> okay. And our last case. So I wanted to give you all an example of work that can be done in the outpatient setting. So we did one for somebody, the first patient who's getting chemotherapy biweekly. Um, the second patient is in an emergency room, ultimately admitted to the hospital and managed there until she was safe. Um, but this is an example of what can be done if you work in one of those co-located clinics that I talked about. So I worked in an HIV clinic for many years. And HIV is one of the areas where there's always been a natural relationship with psychiatry. Um, if you think about the evolution of how HIV came about, lots of stigma in terms of who was getting exposed to HIV and who had AIDS and who was dying. There weren't any uh, treatments in the beginning. So a lot of people died. There was a lot of trauma associated with HIV. And there remains a lot of stigma surrounding the diagnosis of HIV even though we've come sort of light years in terms of the treatment. And there remains a lot of issues sort of managing patients who have HIV, especially certain types of patients. I'll talk about Mr. Johnson. It's a 26 year old man. He identifies as a man who sleeps with men. Um, he was diagnosed in HIV, with HIV in 2011 after he uh, did a neighborhood outreach testing day. So he comes to the HIV clinic to restart his antiretroviral medications. He hasn't been on them for about nine months. If you know anything about HIV care, if you start and stop antiretrovirals, you can build resistance. Uh, your viral strain can build resistance and it can be harder and harder to treat you. And you may need more and more medications uh, to treat the HIV. Um, and this is his third HIV clinic. So he's jumping from clinic to clinic. Um, he describes a history of physical and sexual abuse in childhood. He's smoking cannabis every day and he's living with friends here and there. And I put that in quotations because a lot of times patients will describe their living situations very vaguely, but this essentially means that he's homeless. Um, he's unemployed, he has no family supports, and he's getting food stamps. That's the only way he has adequate access to food. Um, so in the clinic that I worked in, there was like pretty robust social work uh, assistance, case managers to help people to kind of get hooked up with uh, social services, food stamps, things like that. So they knew a lot of this information about their patients, especially given the nature of HIV. This is a very sort of uh, informed clinic. And, and it was a lot of people working together to try to manage uh, patients um, and to keep them basically taking their antiretroviral medications. Because if you take them, you can essentially have an undetectable viral load um, and live a pretty healthy life uh, with HIV now. Um, but a lot of people are stuck in the stigma of the 80s and early 90s that if I, this is a death sentence for me. So a lot of times there's, there's a lot of difficulty coming to grips with the diagnosis. So imagine that you're the psychiatrist working in the clinic He's referred for a psychiatric evaluation, for well, one for depression. And again, that's a, like a common theme 
especially if patients are non-adherent to their treatments, so there's always a wonder, like, is this person depressed? Um, and for the substance abuse, because he's smoking cannabis every day. So I want to know if there's questions about Mr. Johnson. Who's here with us? Zach is here with us. Hello. Hey, Zachary. Hi. Um, so the first question that comes to mind for me um, with Mr. Johnson would be, um, is it the depression uh, that he's possibly self-medicating um, with the cannabis um, to treat? Um, or is there another underlying layer that's driving, that is, has gone um, maybe undiagnosed? Um, uh, and maybe some of that's worked to be done in therapy. Um, so it's like through what lens um, would be the best approach in, in providing care. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Does that make and, sense? Yeah. And it sounds like the, be, because he's trying to get reengaged in a long term treatment clinic where he would be seen mm -hmm. there over a course of years, essentially, you have time to work with the other members of the team in that clinic to help him because he has a lot of issues. Um, so think about taking medications if you're homeless, keeping track of pills, um, being able to get to the pharmacy and actually get your prescriptions filled, um, having enough access to food because uh, you have to support your nutrition, especially if you have a chronic disease like HIV. Um, so there's a lot that has to be done for him. And so if you only focus on this question about depression and substance abuse, you miss the larger picture with him. Great. Thank you. So, so Anika, a question that came up here um, with Zachary's question about smoking cannabis and, and mm -hmm. potentially self-medicating. Uh, Brian asks, consuming cannabis indicates depression, question <laughs> mark? Not necessarily. Um, but take this into context with somebody who has the history of physical and sexual abuse he could be trying to deal with symptoms related to that trauma. Maybe he has anxiety. Maybe he has PTSD. Um, if he's smoking every day, it doesn't necessarily mean he has a, a cannabis use disorder. But you need to really take time to parse that out. I think cannabis has become, and I use this example because I, cannabis has become much more accepted in our society. You can get a medical marijuana card. Um, people use it all the time for different things. But again, like any substance, you have to look at the frequency of the use, whether or not there are other symptoms that the patient feels are being treated or managed by the cannabis. And ultimately, like, it's a conversation uh, about sort of reducing any harm that could come to him by smoking cannabis every day. Um, same thing we would do with alcohol or any other drug is to try to understand why does he need to use it every day. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any, any other questions? So we find out when you ask him what his concerns are, he wants to get disability and he's concerned that he doesn't have stable housing, which makes sense because he doesn't have any income and he's really not living anywhere. He doesn't think marijuana is a problem. And he says, look, I don't want substance abuse treatment. That's another thing that a psychiatrist will do is sort of dis continue to see the patient, continue to engage them, but sort of help move that conversation along and decide, does he have a substance use problem or not? Because um, the doctors or the team in the HIV clinic may have just decided, yeah, he has a problem with cannabis, but he might not. Um, he says he's occasionally depressed and isolated, but he denies that he's suicidal. Um, and that's also another thing that people wonder is, are you slowly trying to kill yourself by not taking your antiretrovirals? Do you just wish you weren't here because you're having trouble with the diagnosis? Those are questions to ask people. Um, and so over time, he actually improves regarding his medical visits, but he still misses the psychiatric appointments. Um, he gets started on an antidepressant, but really doesn't show a lot of improvement. Um, and then we find out that intermittently when they test his urine, he's positive for cocaine uh, some, sometimes, but always positive for the marijuana. So he's using the marijuana much more consistently, but he's occasionally using cocaine. 
one thing you have to know about cocaine is that there's something called a cocaine crash. And so after you use cocaine, in the next day or two, a lot of people have symptoms of depression. They can become suicidal. They present a lot to emergency rooms when they're crashing from cocaine. And that's another thing that CL psychiatrists would have to evaluate. Um, eventually, he accepts substance abuse treatment, so it takes some time. Um, and once that happens, his adherence to the antiretrovirals improves, but he's still missing those psychiatric appointments. Uh, so sometimes it's not as much about the person seeing the psychiatrist, but the psychiatrist working with the medical team to keep the person healthy, taking their medications, um, helping to highlight where the issues are and spending some time to understand Mr. Johnson and sort of what he needs, what he wants. And so that's that liaison role. Um, so I take it as a win that he's taking his antiretrovirals, that he at least tried an antidepressant, but he's really working with the substance use part now, which seemed to really have affected him. Right. All right. So that's all I got. So I'm happy to answer any questions. And this is like a little fun CL <laughs> bingo. So we keep this all the psychiatry residents that rotate with us. They kind of keep track of the kind of consults they get. Um, and so these are a lot of the, the questions that we get. New onset psychosis or schizophrenia after 60 is a fun one because uh, that usually means a person has dementia or something like that. Um, the day of discharge saying, hey, should we change this person's antidepressant or something like that? <laughs> so there's always fun things that happen in CL. Um, and I put this here so that people can get a sense of the types of questions we get in the hospital, but also by going through the other cases, just really seeing the breadth of what a CL psychiatrist does and that there's a lot of different settings that we can work in. Awesome. If you guys have any questions you want to come on and ask some questions, you can do so now. Raise your hand. I'll bring you on. Zachary, any uh, any questions non, non case related for uh, Dr. Forrester? Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> All right, we'll take that as a no. Um, bring on a few more people here. Uh, one interesting question that came up, uh, how much do you look at nutrition with, with patients? Oh, quite a bit. Um, actually, if you suspect that somebody is having new onset issues with their memories, uh, like you're thinking they have a dementia, there's been some other acute change, a lot of the... Uh, laboratory tests that we order in the hospital look at people's nutrition status, like their vitamin, the B12, folate, because those are things that can really affect your cognition and your thinking. So nutrition is very, very important. And a lot of times if you have certain nutritional deficiencies, you might actually present like you're very depressed or you could have acute changes, um, especially for people who drink alcohol a lot. Uh, people who drink alcohol a lot can have thiamine deficiencies. And in the hospital, if you don't replete the thiamine, it can wreak havoc on a person's brain if they, if they drink a lot. And yeah. so that's something that's done in emergency rooms all the time. They give banana bags now that have thiamine in it to make sure they're repleting that. So the nutritional status of a patient is very important. Yeah. Um, awesome. Awesome. I think, uh, and those vegans got to watch out for those vegans. And <laughs> Absolutely. <12. laughs> uh, Daniel. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I just have one question. Um, so you're talking about, you know, um, taking care of both the physical and the mental health of the patient, you know, because sometimes, uh, the main doctor, like, um, in the case of, uh, the one with colon cancer, the oncologist might, might not have asked about the mental health, you know, can the main doctor, I guess, of that, you know, um, condition, can they ask the same questions that you do about like their mental health? They can. And a lot of times we, uh, any part of the standard initial history and physical of a patient should include whether or not they have a psychiatric history, but that's sort of not always done. And it depends on how the patient comes to the doctor. So we do, we do 
sort of would like, we would like for our medical and surgical colleagues to really ask these questions more in depth. But there's sort of a limit to what they can do depending on the setting that they're in, but at least to screen people to try to understand, is there anything that's going on now, especially if you're an oncologist? Because cancer, as I mentioned, is a pretty life-altering diagnosis, and it means a lot to different people. Um, So to at least screen them or have a process to screen them for certain specialties, I think is critical, but it's a standard part of the history and physical. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Nice. Thanks, Daniel. Christopher. Oh, hey there. Is my audio working? Yes. Hi, Christopher. Okay. uh, Before my question, I just want to say thank you for introducing me to this specialty. I didn't even know it existed, (laughs) and I'm very excited to explore it. Absolutely. Um, But my question is, like, earlier on in the presentation, you mentioned how CL psychiatrists work on these things called ethics committees. Have you ever worked on these? And if so, what does that process kind of look like? Yes, I have. Um, So an ethics committee is a multidisciplinary team that's usually comprised of the various medical specialties that might be involved in a specific patient uh, care issue, um, including we also think about like social work, case management. There's usually like a hospital lawyer involved. Um, and a psychiatrist. And so the purpose of having an ethics committee is to talk about those gray zone cases uh, where it's not so clear cut what should be done for the patient um, or whether or not it's ethical to do that. So usually they're talking about end of life decision making, whether to take somebody off of life support or not whether to do invasive procedures on people that may or may not understand the consequences of those procedures, or maybe there's issues with the family. The family can't agree about whether or not the procedure should be done, even though the doctors think it might need to be done. So whenever there's a conflict and there's a gray zone about what should be done and how it should be done, that's the purpose of an ethics committee. And I I absolutely have served on those. And it's very interesting because not everything is cut and dry in medicine. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks, Christopher. Vivian. Hi, thank you for choosing me. So I'm just wondering um, how long you typically treat the patient and if it's for the duration that they're in the hospital or if you continue with their care after they are discharged. So I personally only see patients when they're in the hospital. And the duration of time depends on what is happening with the patients. So for some patients, I have to follow them throughout the whole entire hospital stay. If I'm recommending that they engage in psychiatric care after they leave the medical hospital, then sometimes I'm involved in arranging that follow-up care um, and making sure the patient understands, like if I'm starting them on medication, that kind of thing. Sometimes it's much more of a short uh, interaction depending on whether or not there was like a specific question that needed to be answered about the patient. Usually if there's like a safety question, um, and so that can be a short one time. So it really depends. But we're, we typically are doing shorter acute care in the hospital. And we're not, most CL psychiatrists are not necessarily following the patients once they leave the hospital. Although you can do that if you choose to. Okay, awesome. So um, one follow-up question, would you, if they were to need a psychiatrist um, after they're in the hospital, would you refer them to a psychiatrist that focuses on like the long-term care? Yes. And so in my hospital system, like we have various mechanisms by which we refer people. So we have a psychiatrist that works in the cancer center. And so if I see somebody uh, like the first patient, if I saw that patient in the emergency room or she was admitted uh, for her chemotherapy and I wanted her to get connected with that psychiatrist, then I would make sure that we arrange that. And because the psychiatrist works in the cancer center, the patient doesn't have to go to a different appointment, which we understand from that first case could be difficult for her because uh, she's unemployed and she's sort of barely getting to her chemotherapy. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Vivian. Harrison. Barely. I can hear you. It's low. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll try to speak up. Sorry. It's the best I got. Uh, <laughs> so I am really interested in psychiatry. That's the specialty I want to go into. Um, what is your recommendation for the best pre-medical experience for psychiatry? 
Uh, so I don't know that uh, sort of academically you need to do more than the prerequisites for medical school. Um, I think if you want to get more exposure, you may want to find uh, a psychiatrist that you can maybe shadow for a summer, somebody who's doing the type of work in psychiatry that you're interested in. Um, look in your local area, think about the hospital, the major academic hospital that's close to you. We've had students come uh, to University of Maryland like as observer volunteers. Um, it's sometimes difficult to get direct patient access in a, in a hospital setting, but you may be able, like if somebody's working in a clinic or a private practice, you may actually be able to shadow them and see patients with them. Okay. Yeah. I've been trying to find psychiatrists to shadow, but they're, uh, you know, with patient confidentiality, they're, they're pretty mm -hmm. tough to, to shadow. So my experience has been looking into, uh, psych techs and I've been volunteering at the suicide hotline. So I think that's as close as I can mm -hmm. find in my area, but yeah, I appreciate the recommendation. Yeah. And if you have like a community mental health center, um, something somewhere where they provide care for patients who are sort of the most disadvantaged, there may be opportunities. It may not involve direct patient care, but there may be opportunities to work with a psychiatrist or work with a team. So I would look into that as well. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Harrison. Last but not least, Kevin Oliver. Hello. 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 Uh, I was just watching the presentation and wondering if your evaluation of patients ever created a, a kind of a conflict with the uh, other doctors involved as far as the, the, the best patient care yeah, so sometimes we disagree about what is happening with a patient. Um, I saw a patient today, actually, where it was a suicide risk assessment. We didn't feel like the patient was high risk, but the family like insists now that this patient be admitted to a psychiatry unit. And so then that, that now creates like a bit of tension and the doctors may feel um, sort of uh, obligated to sort of go with the family's requests. Sometimes I recommend medications that doctors may or may not agree with. So we have to kind of talk about it. But ultimately as a consultant, especially in the hospital setting, I'm simply consulting. So it's really still up to the main doctors who are taking care of the patient to decide whether or not to follow the recommendations that I've made. So it's a fine sort of balance that we have to maintain because I can't really tell them what to do. Um, and the only things I really have control over are whether or not somebody needs to be admitted to a psychiatry unit because they're suicidal or there's some other significant psychiatric issue going on. Those are the things that are within my sort of realm of control to recommend and sort of make happen. Great. Sounds good. It seems like a lot of treatments are very stressful for the patients psychiatrically. Absolutely. And I think that that gets missed a lot. Um, I saw a patient who has mesothelioma. If you know anything about mesothelioma, it is basically fatal and your most patients are expected to die within a year of the diagnosis because it's usually pretty advanced by the time they find that type of a cancer. And so it's a very difficult to understand like how you work with somebody like that because they know they have a terminal illness. Uh, there's a lot of things that people have to navigate once they find something like that out. And so as a psychiatrist, like you can treat when it's appropriate, but you have to explain and sort of help people to kind of cope and get through. You have to help the family. You have to help the oncologist. A lot of oncologists have a lot, a hard time dealing with patients who are terminal. Um, so there's a, there's a lot to be done in those situations. Great. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, we have one more who snuck in here, Jomana. <laughs> uh, and, and something you had mentioned, and, and this is way above and beyond probably what anyone needs to know, but there's a difference. You mentioned you're typically a consultant. You are being consulted uh, and aren't really in charge of the patient. You make recommendations, and then whoever is is the service of record is is the one ordering or fo following your your advice or not uh, right. versus being having a patient referred to you then you're in charge of that patient. So there's a difference right. between consults and referrals exactly. as you get through this process. So, yeah. Anyway, Jumana, <laughs> are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. 
All right. Um, so my question would be kind of like a follow up to Dr. Gray's question, because uh, I was going to ask if you ever have to force someone to go on medicine, if they're like a danger to society, um, because like coming from a culture where mental health isn't really, you know, believed in, mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's hard to convince parents like, you know, that you, their kids like need help or something like that. Mm -hmm. So how do you like explain to them the importance of like medication for their kids or for themselves? So that's a great question. And I, I've had recently a few cases where culturally um, the person having a mental health issue was sort of not really uh, accepted. Uh, I had somebody who had a serious suicide attempt where the family tried to sort of explain it away. Um, and this person was in the intensive care unit. So it was very serious what happened to them. And I'll say that in the hospital side, we have to keep people safe. So we recommend, like, if we think somebody is acutely at risk for suicide, like some, they have to be watched 24 hours a day. But when it comes to medication, like to treat depression or anxiety, uh, most states in the United States do not allow those medications to be forced um, mm -hmm. onto a patient unless they are a danger at that moment to themselves or someone else. So you can give medications to calm a person down if they're acutely agitated or trying to harm themselves or somebody else. But to keep them on a long term medicine is very difficult to force. Mm -hmm. um, so when they go to an inpatient psychiatry unit, there's a whole system and process where you have to take a patient to court uh, to get them on medication if you really believe that they're dangerous either to themselves or someone else. Um, but outside of those scenarios, I really try to educate patients and families, especially for things like depression, because depression is very treatable. Um, yes. But it really requires engagement, not only from the patient, but support from the family, because if the family doesn't believe in it, the person might want to take an antidepressant or they might want to see a psychiatrist and or a therapist, but they might hold themselves back because they feel shame that the family won't accept that they're getting treatment. So we talk about how this is no different from the other parts of your medical care, that your mental health is equally as important as any other type of physical ailment you might have. And ultimately, if your mental health is not stabilized, you are at risk for even worse health outcomes. Um, and so we know that people that have untreated depression or untreated schizophrenia have worse issues related to diabetes, hypertension, uh, their risk for stroke and heart attack. Um, because they're generally not taking care of themselves. Um, so you really want to stress um, that this is all about a holistic approach to health. And if you have a treatable mental illness, it's worthwhile to treat it, learn more about it, and get support to accept that this is now a part of your health story. Great. Thank you so much. Love it. Absolutely. Great question. Dr. Neek Forrester, thank you so much for taking some time away from family to hang out with <laughs> us uh, lowly pre-meds down here. Uh, I appreciate you. I appreciate your time. If you want more information about consultation liaison psychiatry, go check out Specialty Stories. Dr. Forrester came on and uh, spent some more time with me talking about it. So I will uh, say goodnight to everyone. Thank you so much for coming on. Have a great night. And again, Dr. Forrester, thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody.